अवसर से मैंने आज से दो साल पहले आग्रह किया था कि आप हिंदी विभाग को समय दीजिए हमें भी अपने ज्ञान से जोड़िए सर ने कहा कि बिल्कुल मैं आऊंगा लेकिन जैसा आप लोग जानते हैं ज्यादातर हमारे वक्ताओं के साथ जो समस्या होती है वो है हिंदी भाषा में बोलने की बात होता तो हमने इसको बाध्यता नहीं रहने दी है हमने सर से कहा है कि आप अपनी जो भी नेचुरल लैंग्वेज है जिसमें सहज रूप से आप बात कर सकते हैं उसको चुन सकते हैं तो इस आज के लेक्चर का जो फॉर्मेट होगा वो अंग्रेजी हिंदी बांग्ला मिला जुला होगा विषय बिल्कुल नए ढंग का है नए किस्म का है और हमें बड़े स्कॉलर से ऐसे ही यूनिक विषय पर व्याख्यान देने की उम्मीद भी करते हैं तो अपेक्षा भी करते हैं हमने शीर्षक देखा होगा प्रकृति पुरातत्व और सारे एवं मेरे प्रिय छात्र छात्राओं आज प्रेमचंद अंतर विषय व्याख्यान माला की इक्कीसवीं कड़ी है बहुत शीघ्र हम 25वीं में पहुंच जाएंगे और मेरा आग्रह है कि उस समय हम अवश्य ऋषि जी को सुनेंगे 25वीं कड़ी में क्योंकि इस व्याख्यान माला की पूरी परिकल्पना इसकी पूरी रूप रेखा ये ऋषि जी ने की है और निरंतर इस व्याख्यान माला को वो आपके सामने प्रस्तुत कर रहे हैं और हमें वो सौभाग्य दे रहे हैं कि हम सपंदा जैसे महान व्यक्तित्व से उनके विचार जान सकें हिंदी विभाग की ओर से सपंदा मैं आपका तहे दिल से स्वागत करती हूँ सपंदा क्या है या अलग से बोलने की बताने की भी जरूरत नहीं है वो एक जीवंत विश्व कोशागार है इनके साथ जब मुझे काम करने का मौका मिला था एक चयन प्रक्रिया के दौरान तब जितने भी बाहर से आने आमंत्रित विशेषज्ञ थे हिंदी भाषा के वे बहुत हैरान हुए थे क्योंकि तो उन्हें लगा था कि सपंडा को हिंदी साहित्य की जानकारी नहीं होगी लेकिन सपंडा की जानकारी और जिस तरह से उन्होंने प्रश्न पूछे थे और जिस तरह से अपनी बात रखी थी हर कोई बहुत हैरान हो गए थे और मैं एक छोटा सा संस्मरण उसी संदर्भ में बोलना चाहती हूँ जब सारी प्रक्रिया ख़त्म हो गई तब और भी हम हैरान हुए उन्होंने हर जो प्रतिभागी था उससे क्या प्रश्न पूछा गया उसमें क्या उत्तर दिया गया वो पूरा लिखित था एकदम टू दी पॉइंट मैंने इस ऐसा अनुभव मुझे इसके पहले कभी नहीं हुआ था तो आज आप देखेंगे समझेंगे सुनेंगे और वाकई ये हमारे लिए बहुत ही गौरव एवं सौभाग्य का वक्त है कि आज हमारे बीच सपंडा हैं उनके कार्यों का भी एक इतना विस्तृत विवरण मुझे लगता है ये भी संक्षिप्त था पूरा नहीं था है ना संक्षिप्त ही था लेकिन वो इतना विस्तृत था इतना इतना उनका योगदान है लेकिन सादगी में उनकी कोई और तुलना नहीं है बहुत ही सरल हृदय बहुत ही सादगीपूर्ण उनका व्यवहार है सपंदा मैं आपको आमंत्रित करती हूँ हमारे इस कार्यक्रम के लिए अब मैं आज के विशिष्ट वक्ता प्रोफेसर स्वपन चक्रवर्ती सर से निवेदन करता हूँ वो आए और अपना व्याख्यान बहुत धन्यवाद 
आने के लिए और मुझको बंगला या अंग्रेजी में थोड़ा वो बोलने की अवसर देने की कुछ ज़्यादा भी हो गया भानु सिंह साहब की इंट्रोडक्शन लेकिन ये जो लेक्चर है ये बहुत ज़्यादा नहीं है संक्षिप्त है लेट मी रीड अ पोएम विच एवरीबडी नोट्स शैली इज वॉज इमैंडियस ना दिस पोएम वॉज रिटर्न एज अ काइंड ऑफ प्लेफुल कॉम्पिटिशन विद अ विद अ फ्रेंड द रूएंस from egypt uh, parts of, uh, of them like they have been from very various places in nineveh and mesopotamia and other places they came to the british museum don't read what is there you won't find it there um i have brought that because there are some pictures there i did not have the time to prepare a powerpoint so i just got the text along and put some picture boxes and uh, the pictures there and these uh wo murti vagera jo hai they were being brought to the british museum the beautiful and this was that of ramesses the second and shelly wrote a poem which shrimati is familiar with uh, called ozymandias because in greek Ramesses the second was known as Ozymandias, and uh, the poem says that look, you have built such a beautiful standing figure, but now you are in the dust. Dust. Your civiliz civilization has disappeared. So don't boast. You will be reduced to ruins. and the poem is about the vanity of human pride or this is a tautology you cannot have a vanity of human right vanity of human power right and this was made possible by the archaeological findings during the colonial period so let me read shelley's poem ozymandias this is this is a better way of approaching a lecture lecture because after all all i know is literature i don't know much about archaeology i try to talk about things which i don't know about because now i know that i'm so old that people will not say bad things about me not to my face so even if i am ignorant they will let me off when i was 30 years old they said shut up nowadays you will they will say nice things about me like bhanu singh saab said <laughs> even if he doesn't like the le lecture there's no 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 option i met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert you see the torso and the face was brought to the british museum in london the legs were just standing in the desert half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command bad commandi after all he was you know ramus is the second tell that it's sculpt sculptor well who those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocks them and the heart that fed and all and the pedestal these words appear my name is ozymandias king of kings now this of course is rubbish they could not read the uh, hieroglyphic message over there there were two kinds of scripts in egyptian as you know the hieroglyphic and the demotic so <clears throat> my name is ozymandias king of kings look on my works in mighty and despair nothing beside remains round the decay of the colossal wreck boundless and bare 
the lone and level sands stretch far away. What is archaeology? It tells us of the past, perhaps not. It doesn't tell us anything about the past. This poem is an anticipation in 1818 of what today we call post-processual archaeology or what is actually hermeneutic archaeology, that is interpretative archaeology. You get the debris, the remains of the past, you piece them together and try to make a pattern, a meaning out of things that you actually don't know. You piece together a narrative and a meaning. Archaeology is about the present. The question that we ask about the past is possible only from our perch in the present. Someone 200 years back asked different questions and someone 200 years from now will ask different questions of archaeology, just as we literary scholars ask of the text. The questions that we ask of a literary text today, let's say of Shakespeare or the Mahabharata or whatever, are not the questions that people asked in the past. Those of you who are familiar with a philosopher called Hans Georg Gadamer will know that this is the science of what is known as hermeneutics. Vyakya Vigyan. And uh, this changes with history. This is my subject. What about nature, Prakriti? Well, most scholars would agree with now, you can look at the screen, Bruno Latour, the author of Politics of Nature, that the word nature has become outward. Well, it makes no, means nothing nowadays. Nature was privileged by Rousseau and the Romantics. As that which was at odds with culture and art. Yet, as Carl Woodring pointed out in his influential 1977 essay, Nature and Art in the 19th Century, the century which began in Europe with the triumph of nature, it ended in France and England with what? With art for art's sake. You start with nature and you end with Oscar Wilde. And Oscar Wilde says that nature is only useful when it imitates art, not the other way round. So there is a kind of ambivalence, a kind of ambiguity in the word nature. What does the word mean? Natura naturata, in Latin, could be creation as one found it. Prakriti, Nisarga, the world around you. While natura naturans was nature as force, process and law. Something that you find, for example, in physics. That is how, for example, uh, Spinoza, the philosopher, would make a distinction between the, the two ideas of nature. Although it was less dynamic in the 18th century than the Romantics would later imagine it to be, the laws could be a fixed say, set, say God made the world and then disappeared. There were these laws, autotelic, and they would run the world like just like a clockmaker makes the clock and then disappears and the clock runs on its own. That is the kind of idea that is usually called deist, deism. A good instance of the belief would be Pope's, Alexander Pope's epitaph on Newton, nature and nature's laws hidden, lay hidden night. Oh, there's a, I, I dropped a word. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. So these laws of nature can also be nature. However we look at it, so when you see Rabindranath saying, oh, don't read books, go and look at nature or words worth say, well, nature can be there in the books as well, when you are working out sums, and not in the trees and the monkeys that you see on the trees. So there are other ways of looking at nature. However we look at it, the tension between nature and art could dissolve at the mere slight of a semantic hand. As Polixenes says to Perdita of the art of grafting in Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. I'll explain this. Anyone who is interested in gardening in this class? Gardening? 
very interesting gardening column kora at a graft kore arakta the column kore you can change the even the color of a flower well so that is culture horticulture but that means is nature's means it is not your your art is also na nature the same play shows leontes mis mistaking his wife for a statue in the last scene until hermione descends from the pedestal in a rare meeting of art and nature oh she's warm if this be magic let it be an art lawful as eating oi sob shomoy shakespeare onode theke bhalo lekhe you see when nature meets art what are you seeing you are seeing a sculpture meeting an actor on the stage which is rarer than what you are seeing among the viewers inside the playhouse which one is culture and which nature anyway nature could be the beauty of the created world or the tendency of humans to configure an alternative world in art you love you love the forest right i can see it in your eyes you love the forest and you love a garden no no i'm just pointing at you to make fun of you but which is nature the garden is a human artifact the wilderness is not and if you say that the wilderness is a, a sublime try to spend a night in the wilderness and most probably you will love gardens better than the wilderness but there are people who love the wilderness better nature could be either insensate matter or an intelligent and benign universe a young rabindranath tagore wrote the play prakriti pratishodh the Na revenge of nature in 1884 he was just uh, 23 years old he actually wrote it when he was 22 years old in which a little homeless girl called prakriti as natural as bonkim chandra's kapal kundala exactly like miranda or kapal kundala restores an ascetic sunnashi to the world humans love and to its beauty she as prakriti is the golden boat this is the first time rabindranath uses the phrase shunar karani he would later write a book of that name shunar karani shunar karani which bridges the sea dividing the sanyasin from the material creation or jagat he has renounced nature is nothing if unmediated by human love nature is raw tooth and claw if you face a tiger you can't say well i love the tiger because you know the tiger is nature i love being its food and because i am a romantic poet i don't think no any romantic poet would love meeting a tiger on those terms so it has to be mediated by human love and that is what that little boy actually tagore at the age of 22 was trying to say else nature is incomplete in kuwait untrue e jagat mithya noy buji shotto hobe mithya hoye prokashiche amader chokhe the world is evolving as something that is spurious but we can fabricate an alternate world through our love the same tagore would wake up on the shore of the river rupnarayan to the hard truth of the world rid of every shred of illusion and express it in a brief poem written a couple of months before his death in 1941 from the age of 22 to the age of 80 the same motif had not left the poet poet in the interim he would he could doubt the benevolence of nature as against human emotions in such a poem as sindhu tarangu in manushi there was a shipwreck near puri and tagore asks god whether uh, there is an intelligent universe at all or is it only human love that we mistake as benign or discern in the silence of the material universe the promise of the birth of human consciousness for 60 million years 
there was there was no human being on this planet how can you say navras that time is human history alone no history is for human beings jivanand das the great bengali poet said manusher proyojon jene kothao biruchito noy shomoy time is not for human beings there were other people on earth but rubindranath tries to say in samudra prati that we still hear the prehistoric time when the planet was waiting with geology for history to happen because the evolution is towards human consciousness because human consciousness is the mirror in which nature after all we are natural creatures we are creatural we can nature can look at itself look back upon itself so he had all kinds of um uh, and most probably this was influenced by tennyson's de profundis which has the tennyson was writing at the time when all the geological ideas of rock formation and and darwin they were coming into you know place in european thought and um, that the idea that nature was evolving towards human consciousness was becoming popular and tagore wrote a, 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 a review of de profundis when he was 19 years old calling it a better poem than paradise lost well because it appealed to him of course we don't agree with him we you don't have to agree with tagore everything that tagore has said but we find these things in his literature of late eco criticism and eco philosophy have explored the dimensions of literature and other creative media in a spirit of environmental concern which i have just touched upon that not just the concern for human beings and our love and mediated by love but other creatures who also have their place in the universe uh <clears throat> and there is something what uh, this norwegian philosopher arn nes who is influenced as uh, you know by gandhi uh, deep ecology so uh, trying to find deep ecology in literature i will not speak any more on this huge subject i will just speak on landscapes and ar- archaeology archaeology both as scientific pra- practice and changing hermeneutic that is in the widest sense interpretative discipline theories in archaeology and theories of literature now you will have to forgive me if i talk about myself when we were in college in presidency college uh, i entered as a student in 1972 uh the rage don't worry i'm not going to talk about the naxalites the rage in uh, literary studies was what was known as new criticism srimothi will remember those days when we were uh, taught to trust the poem and not the poet because the poem is itself a complete autonomous artifact কেন এরকম হয়েছিল কেন আরে পয়সা চাই তো নাকি ইউনিভার্সিটি ডিপার্টমেন্টে হিন্দি ডিপার্টমেন্ট গরিব ডিপার্টমেন্ট কম্পেয়ার্ড টু লেট আস এ লাইফ সায়েন্স ডিপার্টমেন্ট লাইফ সায়েন্স বলতে পারে যে আমরা ক্যান্সার ট্যান্সার ছাড়িয়ে দেবো সারিয়ে দেবো হিন্দি পড়ে তো ক্যান্সার সারানো যাবে না ইউ নিড এ পার্টিকুলার স্কিল when it is an academic discipline after the second world war the american universities and the european universities had a very difficult time in funding for public funding of higher education only anglo saxon and norse was taught taught in english departments in oxford it is in india and in presidency college that english was taught as an academic discipline the first professor of poetry to deliver his address in english was matthew arnold in 1857 
Calcutta University was born the next following year. Before that, you just spoke in Latin. So you must understand. I will do that card. I will go to that card. Why not? Because I am the archaeology guy. I will not touch any colonialism. It is some purpose. There is a link between the colon, the we as colony, and the use of archaeology, especially in ordnance survey. And um, therefore, the Americans had to justify funding by saying that you can unpack the text. It gives you the special skill to look at texts, and there is you are a, you are an, as professional expert like any other professional expert. And we had media studies, media theory, and all these things emerging out of the academia of English studies uh, in the United States, translation theory, and so on. So we, at presidency, we were being taught Clarence Brooks and others uh, who had to who look. We, we would look at image patterns in plays and poems. Don't you know what it is? Chitra kalpo ki ho ba ki ho chye. Ora hi shom kore. Kore pas kore. Bhalo bhalo number pa. Bhalo. Tumra bhalo number pa. Bhalo. Thik. But we were we were discouraged. From actually looking at what is happening behind the writing, and don't trust the poet. People said, "Look, the author may have been anonymous. Still, you have to look at the text." Now, exactly the opposite. What what uh, interested me was people like Lewis Binford and Colin Renfrew. In uh, archaeology, was saying at the same time exactly the opposite thing in the early 70s. Why? They were saying that look, if you look at pottery shards, if you look at uh, remains from the past which you see in the museum, like for example the Indian Museum in on Chorungi, you feel like you know in 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 in, in uh, archaeology, in processual archaeology, that these. Pottery shards have divide, de developed legs without any human heads to them. Just remove the word pottery and make it poetry, and this again would be the situation with new criticism. So new criticism is trying to make poetry autotelic and end in itself, whereas archaeology was going. It was a reverse traffic. Was going the other way. So I got some ideas from archaeology when I was a student, rather than from the American new critics, and that has determined the way I have read literature. And that is not because of archaeology, but of course the influence of what I have read in Bengali of Marxism and other things that were in the air during that time. <coughs> In, in in Europe, of course, you have the the formalists, the Russian formalists, Shklovsky and others, searching for motives and patterns, and of course, then came the stru structuralists and people who look for topoi. Topos so check a subject, a tabisha, it's a repeated by Barba. You find it, for example, in uh, Curtius's. European literature and the Latin Middle Ages, etc. Their impact registered somewhat later in the field of archaeology. A structuralist approach to archaeological theory, I'm not an archaeologist, as far as I'm able to tell, was not consciously articulated until Henry Glassy's 1975 work on folk housing in Middle Virginia. So. Proto-structuralist approaches in literature was there since the 1920s and 30s, whereas this is the 1970s. Very late, very late, as far as literary scholars are concerned. Then, in the 1970s, we were moving away from structuralism towards new historicism and other. Uh, 1980 saw Stephen Greenblatt's 
uh, book coming out and new historicism uh, getting headlines. The differences were major, but there are points of convergence that would reward the atten at at attention of scholars in both disciplines. Uh, I will skip this part. You see, the in the Renaissance, for example, antiquities were discovered, and Raphael, for example, was made uh, well, put in charge of antiquities in Rome. You must understand that your textbooks and your teachers tell you that the Renaissance artists did this, did that. No, 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 that's not true. That's all false. Why? Renaissance artists did not go to school. They went to something called abacus schools, where they learned mensuration, measurement and manual skills. Even Leonardo, who was a great scientist, did not go to college or school. When you go to the baptistry, the, 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 the figures on the door of the baptistry by the Bisano brothers, they were all directed by humanists, like Leonardo Bruni. Do you think that abstruse uh, interpretation of Botticelli and others, that Botticelli knew all that? No, no. They were taught by humanists, they were commissioned. ठीक है अपन जब उन्हें कुमार तुली तक ये बोला है ना जब आवाज़ ही पुराने रे गोल को उन्हें जाइ तुम ही ये रकम दाखो छोवी दे दिलो मेरे रकम करे तुम ही मूर्ति टापाना बे हाँ उड़ा की प्रेसिडेंसी दे पड़े चे पड़े नहीं तो किंतु तुम ही ओखने ये कुम आत्मा मो कुछ हाँ ये टा मार्कंडे ओ पुरापिन प so when you read the history of the Renaissance, don't believe everything that you read or what you, what, what you are taught. This is the problem with new criticism. Unless you actually understand how the people who created these things, what were what their, what, what were their lives like? Who cooked for them? तीन तो रहते तो मैं भास पड़ चले स्काल्टर नाम सुने चुका हूँ ना शोधित जितना है तीन तो रहते तो जीशु तो पड़े जैसे सुन में ना तार कारण तो उन्होंने आराम आरेख दिन आवाज़ का चेहरे ले तब आज के बोलते पड़ गए अनेक समय लगे दी रूइंस एंड एंटीक्विटीज बिकेम द रेफरेंस पॉइंट्स ऑफ द in order to understand a period as a period, you need a certain distance. What kind of distance? Not just any distance, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, no. When Mao Zedong was asked what he thought of the French Revolution, he supposedly said, this is a rumor of course, that we are too close to it for me to comment. If Greek and Latin cease to be a living language of diplomacy or the language of commentary and humanist letters throughout the continent, if Tuscan or English came up, if Shakespeare was born, then of course you could recognize classical antiquity as different from the use of medieval Latin. It is only when there is such a rupture, such a break, that you understand something as antique. Antique is not the antique, but the antique is not the antique, but the antique is not the antique, but the antique is not the antique. That was the job that Raphael actually used to do. So, Petrarch is writing that sometimes when the farmers are tilling the field, they come across the coin, they run with that and say, how much will this fetch? And Petrarch says, look, this is, this unusual treasure is not, are they, are they unusual because of for artistry or talent? For these are the gifts of fortune, not the laudable merits of men. 
this is just something an, of an accident. You should not be given a single rupee for this. So, rarity value is because of rarity, not because of your possession, but because of your talent. Nevertheless, the excitement created among artists such as Michelangelo by the discovery of Tivoli in the early 16th century, especially of the Laocoon group, is well documented. One of the first person to go there to look at the Tivoli uh, excavation was Michelangelo. And this, of course, uh, had an impact on his culture, the captive, the slave, etc. Hey, you tell guy, chobi aache, what do you have to chobi aache? Hey, hey, hey. Page 5. Page 5. Oh, oh, ami to kodda khate bai. Ki kando? Chalo, 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 chalo. Hey. This is Hadrian's villa in Tivoli. Now the first thing that you notice is that this is a ruin. This is not a complete house. So there was a fashion of building houses which looked like ruins. Not in Calcutta, right? In Calcutta all houses look like ruins. It's a different thing altogether. I don't figure there will be that is fashionable. I don't think so. But in Europe, there was something of this kind. No, no, take it. Rishi, don't worry. And uh, the, the, the discovery of Roman statuary on earth during the period being derived from Greek archetypes gave Renaissance artists such as Raphael uh, a genuine sense of the distance between historical periods. Otherwise, if you have just, you know, law Latin of the medieval period, you wouldn't know how it is different from Cicero. In the same way, if you see Roman statuary which is derived from Greek, you know how much we have this traveled in history, in, 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 the, in art history. As we move down to the early uh, modern and later periods, about which I will not say anything. Why? Because I'm sick and tired of uh, this period. But say William Camden, whose Britannia was pub first published in 1586, gave English writers the idea of the historical palimpsest. Palimpsest manayano. Palimpsest, what is the meaning of palimpsest? If you find a manuscript where you can see the words written under the, su the, the superficial level, then you, on the same parchment, or let us say the palm leaf, you have layers and layers of that is called a palimpsest. In the same way, if you just excavate Delhi, for example, or your city, Lucknow, you will find palimpsests of civilizations. Calcutta is an upstart city, don't find anything here. But uh, you actually find layers and layers of civilization. In the same way, uh, W.G. Hos uh, Hoskins' book, 1955, The Making of the English Landscape, looks at a particular piece of landscape as a document on which many phases of history and geography are written in layers. Now look at what William Cat Camden is writing in William, uh, uh, sorry, in 1594. But now age has erased the very tracks of it and to teach us that cities die as well as men, it is at this day, day a cornfield wherein where the corn is grown up one may observe the drafts of streets crossing one another. For where they have gone the corn is thinner. There's, there's no board here. Try and think of say Esperanto East and Germany. Okay. And look at it from height. And 100 years from now, it is a corn field. Say wheat or. And you find some are growing tall and some are growing short. <coughs> Where Jolly. The, 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 the stretch where Germany passed and these will cross, they will be intersections. 
be a comedy. William Camden was the first person to point out this archaeological, uh, what is known, known as evidence in field archaeology, not in excavation, but in field archaeology. And he was also associated with other discoveries. Thomas Brown, as you know, our hydrotaphia was uh, uh, unburial, was uh, inspired by the finding of urns, funerary urns, which uh, Thomas Brown took, took to be Roman, but we know that they are Anglo-Saxon. I had to I had to teach urn burial, so I don't want to talk about it anymore. Oh, One is tempted to multiply apply examples of such exchanges, but I shall refer to only one, or uh, two. One is the taste for Gothic landscapes and ruins in English, British literature in 18th century, best represented in the works of Horace Walpole, and in his spectacular Strawberry Hill Castle. Now, you have heard of, you know, you, some of you know about The Harry Potter, right, right, Harry Potter. Now it is one thing, uh, well, it is one thing to write Harry Potter, but if you make a pile of money by writing Harry Potter, and then you actually build a house look like, which looks like Hogwarts, that is a diff different thing altogether. I will show you. Uh, this is a, uh, William Holt's map of Cambridgeshire from Michael Drayton's Polyolbion. Polyolbion is a poem which shows the various places and the habits, the, the, the dress, etc. of people who actually lived there. So it is a kind of archaeological poem. But never mind. This is Strawberry Hill. Horace Wal Walpole's house, which looks exactly like his, reads like his novels. The advances in field archaeology of the 17th and 18th century led by such figures as Stukeley, William Stukeley, who surveyed the Stonehenge, you remember, that's the first time the Stonehenge was surveyed, and tried to de date it using the magnetic declivity of the compass. Compass had a magnetic de 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 declivity high. And William Borlas, best known for his st studies on the antiquities and natural history of Cornwall, have a symbiotic link with that predilection in literature and architecture. One could think of a few pieces of the early 17th century Welsh poet and painter John Dyer. John Dyer, I'm giving you just one example. Tis now the raven's bleak abode, tis now the ap uh, apartment of the toad. Ozymandias in Motu, Akon Desert, Kichuneya. And there the fox securely feeds, and there the poisonous adder breeds, concealed in ruins, moss and weeds, while ever the an and anon there falls, huge heap of hoary moulded walls, yet time has seen, and that lifts slow, and level lays the lofty brow, has seen the broken pile complete, big with the vanity of state. Exactly like Ozymandias. But transient is the smile of fate. Ruins recall the ravages of history, but they are also a testimony to a people's past and their identity, a cultural construct that has turned natural with time and decay. Hence the ruins of Rome, in the, written in 19, 1740, sorry, Dar com combines reflections on time with the achievements of Rome, and for that matter, Britain or any other civilization, unearthed by antiquarians and field archaeologists. John Dyer ke tribute ke jo words wa takta kovita li gichi. Now you have seen his home. Now here is Tintern Abbey. William Wordsworth's great poem. Point of nature. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. But he's also a poet of ruins. The nature taking over culture. There you go. At a hollow, body chilo, shop, bombs are against. Now, 
I am showing you something else which is interesting. Walter Savage Landor was a poet, English romantic poet. Now, he had a girlfriend who died in Calcutta. You should go and see her tomb in Park Street Cemetery, Rosa Elma. But anyway, this is Landor's house. You want to live in it? He actually bought a ruin and that ruined his finances. He became totally broke. He had no money. He not only bought this ruin, he actually changed the entire village into a historical ruin in order to make his fa fantasy house into a historical uh, location. The second point that I want to say, and this is the final point, is the close link between field archaeology and excavation outside Britain, especially in the Orient. Cartography is necessary and surveys are necessary to rule colonies. So, especially ordnance surveys. These developments influenced romantic landscapes in British literature and painting as much as archaeological mapping and illustrations. Paul Ashby mentions the work of Sir Richard Court Hall and his surveyor Philip Crocker and their work in Wiltshire in the early 19th century. Ashby also cites the surveys of Cranbourne, Cranbourne Chase and Archer. let me just <coughs> let me just skip over all this. Look at this. Randman Forest. Let, get, let me give, give you the example of one of Philip Crocker's. This is Philip Crocker's drawings. This is not artwork. This is survey for administrative purposes. And an illustration for Sir Richard Holt called the history of ancient Wilshire. Right? Now, compare this with this. This is the ruined quadrangle of Marthand in Kashmir by Sir Alexander Cunningham. Navras, have you read, uh, have you looked at Upinder Singh's book on Upinder? Uh, no, no, no. His, his, her book on Cunningham, earlier. Read that. Ha, ha. There's, a, there's a famous story. But read the Cunningham book on Cunningham. There's, a, there's another book to be written because the Cunningham's letters are in Victoria Memorial. Let some of your students go do some work on that. Okay. The effect of archaeological industry outside Britain and especially in the colonies was felt in colonial landscape in the visual arts and literature. I'm giving you one example. Gavin Hamilton. It, uh, it's the national... Now look at this one. This is in Almera. Now in the news, because of the war in Syria, the attacks by ISIS and other American forces and so on, the ruins of a... Pa I think these are also gone now because of the war situation. The ruins of Palmyra by Gavin Hamilton. Now, I'm going back to this. Compare how the surveyor generals or, or, or the, or the ordnance surveys actually had an impact. The colonial surveys had an impact. Now if you look at this, this is a period piece with other, other people with oriental tur turban but one person in a toga. It's a hodgepodge of all kinds of historical periods. Their idea of what is the Orient was a hodgepodge of many notions and images. Just as this guild hall, which still you can still see in London, is a hodgepodge of many styles, including Indian styles and Gothic styles. 
Now, another example, this is Claude Lorraine, The Voyage of Jacob, 1677. Look at it carefully. And now you are in for a shock. This is in the Victoria Memorial, William Hodges, a view of the fort fort of Allahabad. Look at the fort and go back to Lorraine. That is an aqua tint, therefore a monochrome. The Orient was being recreated in the image of the ruins in the West. Literary landscapes, now you might be wondering, what about literature? We are talking about painting. Reflected this distance in time, constructed in spatially, though archaeological remains. Uh, that in is uh, grammatically wrong. Robert Browning's Love Among the Ruins, for instance, recalls a scene not unlike what we see in Cunningham's drawings. And such plenty and perfection, sea of grass never was, such a carpet as this summertime was, spreads and embed, breads, embeds every visage of the city, guest alone, stock or stone. The city has disappeared. Nature has taken over. Where a multitude of men breathed joy and woe long ago, lust of glory pricked their hearts up, dread of shame struck them tame, and that glory and that shame alike, the gold bought and sold, etc. In one year, they sent a million fighters forth, north and south. And they built their gods a brazen pillar high as the sky like Ozymandias. Yet deserved a thousand chariots in full force, gold of course, O oh heart, O oh flood, O oh blood that freezes, blood that burns. Earth returns for whole centuries of folly, noise and sin, shuts them in with their triumphs and their glories and the rest. Love is best. Many cities have been suggested as Browning source. There are many candidates, Babylon, Jerus Jerusalem, Roman Campania. Johnston Spar argued long back that it was a compos composite of Tarquinia, Vey, uh, Nineveh and Thebes and many capital cities archaeologists had ex excavated in the 19th century, creating a public stir. The poem repeats this familiar theme of the dynamic cycle of nature and culture, we call John Dyer and Shelley, the wilderness of the, uh, of the pastoral and the city, indifferent matter and human creativity, of primordial nature taking over its rightful re legacy from cultural supporters. But the ir irony lies in the recuperation of human love and its value through art, distance of time and space, lost civilizations and loves, could lend new meaning to the relationship, to history and culture, to in addition to the less complex sense of artifice being swallowed by the forces of uncreating nature. Consider the mysterious poem by Rilke, which I shall refrain from commenting upon. You see a mirror, and you seem to find in the mirror the image of the woman you had loved. But through that mirror, you also see the past. Of, of lost civilization. You who had never arrived in my arms, beloved, like a lost civilization as well, who were lost from the start, I don't even know what songs would please you. I have given up trying to recognize you in the surging wave of the next moment. All the immense images in me, the far off, deeply felt landscape, cities, towers and bridges and unsuspected turns in the path and those powerful lands that were once pulsing with the life of the gods. All rise within me to mean you who forever elude me. You beloved who are all the gardens I have ever grazed at, longing an open window in a country house and you almost stepped out pensive to meet me. Streets that I chanced upon you had just walked down them and vanished, and sometimes in a shop. The mirrors were still dizzy with your presence, and startled gave back my too sudden image. Who knows? Perhaps the same bird echoed through both of us yesterday, separate in the evening.
it is such a beautiful poem that I don't want to comment on it. If it doesn't strike you, your loss, not mine. The entwined themes of colony and archaeology have had many poetic renderings in the period of decolonization. Colonial antiquity is no more ex exotic in Derek Walcott's, the, the great Caribbean poet, uh, Ruins of a Great House, written in 1953-4, when he was a research scholar. It has transformed the ruined house of Guava Ridge in the Blue Mountains in the Caribbean into the leprosy of empire. The poem is a cruel variation on the theme of the impermanence of human vanity as also on early mo modern poetic tributes to aristocratic houses such as Andrew Marvel's upon Appleton House. The difference is that the house is reminiscent of the plantation economy that had been built on slavery. It explicitly recalls Dunn's Meditation 17, the meditation on death and Brown's hydrotophia or urn burial, until the poet, an exile from paradise like all humanity, himself becomes part of the layered landscape, an inheritor of the legacy of ancestral murderers and poets. Let me quote the poem. Stones only, the disjecta member of this great house, whose moth-like girls are mixed with candle dust, remain to file the lizards' dragonish clothes, the mouths of those gate, gate cherubs shriek with stain. Ashes, axle and coach wheels silted up under the muck of cattle droppings. Three cow crows flap for the trees and settle, creaking the eucalyptus boughs. A smell of dead limes quickens in the nose, the leprosy of empire. Farewell, green fields, farewell, ye happy groves. Marble like Greece, like Faulkner's South, in stone deciduous beauty, prospered and is gone. But where the lawn breaks in a rash of trees, a spade below dead leaves will ring the bone of animal or human being fallen from evil days, from evil times. It seems the original crops were limes, grown in the silt that clogs the river skirt. The imperious rakes are gone, their bright girls gone, the river flows, obliterating hurt. I climbed a wall with the grill ironwork of exiled craftsmen protecting that great house from guilt perhaps, but not from the worm's rent, not from the padded cavalry of the mouse. And when a wind shook in the flames, I heard what Kipling heard, the death of a great empire, the abuse of ignorance by Bible and by soul, a green lawn broken by low walls of stone dipped to the rivulet and pacing I thought next of men like Hawkins, Walter Raleigh, Drake, and ancestral murderers and poets and poets of it. More perplexed in memory now by every ulcerous crime. The world's green age then was a rotting lime whose stench became the charnel's galleon text. The rot remains with us, the men are gone, but as dead ash is lifted in a wind that fans the blackening ember of the mine, my eyes burn from the ashen prose of dung, which serves as the ep epigraph of the poem. Ablaze with rage, I thought, some slave is rotting in this manorial lake, but still the pole of my compassion fought that Albion too was once. England too was once a colony. A colony like ours, part of the continent, piece of the main, nook shotten, rook overblown, uh, nook shotten, taken from Hopkins, deranged by foaming channels and the vain expense of bitter faction, all in compassion ends so differently from what the heart arranged, as well as if the manners of thy friends. We seem to have moved far away from the questions of theory and to have been decoyed by the blandishments of the literary texts and antiquarian studies. But asympt asymptotic trajectories are visible in the realm of theory as well. Interpretative archaeology in our time has made common cause with literary hermeneutics. The material from the past, like a literary text, here I'm quoting Gadamer, answers only those questions that we ask from our vantage in time and our ideological bias. Gadamer uses difficult language. He says, 
encounter with the text is necessarily recognition of the text is necessarily recognition or recognition. At the same time, interpretative or post-processual archaeology since the 1980s has avowedly attempted to see culture as process open to variant interpretations and occasionally a closed system that we find in certain strands of cultural anthropology. The new historicism in literature, oh sorry, 1920. The new historicism in literary studies since the 1980s has something in common with the latter attitude, although the idea of the poetics of culture propagated by the American new historicist Stephen Greenblatt, leaning as it does heavily on Clifford Gertz's work, work in cultural anthropology, may not always agree with the open-ended hermeneutic of recent archaeology, uh, uh, historic archaeology. In accepting, accepting the open-endedness of interpretation, new archaeology has also risked the Bartzian hypothesis of, of the author's death, the demise of the source of meaning, even when unwilling to let go of the notion of individual agency in culture. The question of agency has made a dramatic return in new archaeology, in which it is often understood as in postmodern historical interpretation of literary texts, as the individual's adaptation of a set of pre-existing codes to impact the collective to which one belongs, a notion that owes much to the work of Anthony Giddens. Do your students read Anthony Giddens? No. Landscape, as we know, is now literally a site for contesting approaches to archaeology. Carol Crumley has de defined landscape as the material manifestation of the relation between humans and the environment. This apparently crisp de definition hides the multiplicity of issues with which con contemporary archaeology is trying to come to terms. As I see it, this is part of the multivalence that marks postmodern approaches in many disciplines. Hence, Landscape is both nature and culture, non-human and human, material and ideational, economic and ideological, a source of sustenance and a part of social practice or experience in the way Pierre Bourdieu or a phenom phenomenologist would see human beings relating to the world of nature. And its material remains are part of this present with which we seek to interpret a partially knowable past. As I said, archaeology is about the present. The past is only partially known. The present is known. All literary texts belong to the present. सैद्धांतिक लेक्चर की अपेक्षा कर रहे थे इस पर कुछ और प्रकाश डालने से पहले मैं चाहूँगा कि हमारे बीच दो स्कॉलर उपस्थित हैं एक हिस्टोरियन नवरस चार्ट अफरीदी जी और प्रोफेसर श्रीमती जी मैं चाहूँगा कि आप दोनों लोग अपनी एक छोटी छोटी टिप्पणी दें क्योंकि आ, ये जो विषय है आपके विषय से भी जुड़ता है तो मैं सबसे पहले श्रीमती जी Called Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan? Mm -hmm. by, uh, by 
portage called Kutba Khan, where, there, where this process of transformation of a wild nature into a beautiful garden is there. And at that time in Europe, Shakunda also spoke about, he spoke of it in a slightly different context, but how the Oriental, he spoke about how the Oriental was being used in Europe to create maps so that they, the, the, uh, the Orient could be ruled or something to that effect. But that began, I would say, even earlier, when Coleridge was using certain ideas he had about the Orient in poems like Kubla Khan. Okay. And he presents Kubla Khan as a great artist who creates a kind of, I'll explain it, reconciliation of opposites. That is, there is sun and there is ice together in a miraculous flow. So art and nature come together in art through the human being. So the artist is a, because romantic poetry always celebrates the artist. So therefore, Kobla Khan called it and called it as, if I could imagine that beautiful tower, I would build it, I would do it, etc., etc., maybe create the perfect form. Another point I think from Chakunda's lecture is why Tintoretto's daughter, who was a very fine artist, is not spoken of in his So if you ever get a chance to read Virginia Woolf's A Room of Monsoon, on, on, on. she has an essay which has this title. In the age of William Shakespeare, where was Judith Shakespeare? There is no Judith Shakespeare to the best of my knowledge. Chakunda would know that better. But it's like in those days, women were not allowed to become authors. So she answers this question herself and says that by 35, if there was a Judith Shakespeare, say as Shakespeare's sister who was, a, you know, who could write. She would be dead by, she would have had about 16 children by the time she was 35. And she would be buried. Her body would be worn out by the extreme cold of a castle. We've seen many pictures of castles, I mean. And uh, she would be dead by 35. Uh, are you with me? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Then why? Why couldn't women cry? Because they were not allowed to. Finally, says that unless you have a physical space, a room of mind, one's own, and some independent income, you cannot become a cult, a woman. So she brings it really, I mean, going away from this romantic idea of imagination and genius and this and that, you need all that to become a writer. Virginia Woolf says, a girl, you don't have a space. That I can claim as mine. And unless I have some access to money, I cannot become, because you always need money to pay for food, for this. So some autonomy, financial autonomy is necessary in order to become So I'll just rest with you. There are so many questions. I am a professor. ढूंढोगे अगर मुल्कों मुल्कों मिलने के नहीं नायाब हैं हम अहले जमाना कदर करो कमयाब हैं हम नायाब ना हो मुझे नहीं याद मुझे नहीं मालूम कि इस शेर का रचयिता कौन है लेकिन ये जरूर जानता हूं कि ये शेर कहा गया था अफसर शौकन चतुर्वर्ती के लिए शेर इस शेर से मेरी वाकफियत बहुत पुरानी है लेकिन शौकन से मुलाकात के बाद जाना कि किस शख्स को जहन में रखते हुए ये शेर कहा गया होगा ऐसे लोग कम होते हैं नायाब होते हैं कमयाब होते हैं जो ऐसी आज़ाद ख्याली बरते हैं कि वो किसी भी मखसूस सब्जेक्ट किसी विषय के महदूद दायरों से बाहर निकल के सोचना जानते हों देखना जानते हों और दिखाना जानते हों और ये हुनर अगर किसी के पास मुझे नज़र आता है तो वो प्रोफेसर चटवर्ती हैं और इसका बहुत ज़बरदस्त मज़ाहरा आज के इस लेक्चर के माध्यम से हुआ
polymath, uh, there is a word called polymath, that is somebody who knows many disciplines. And I am very humble to be saying that you are a polymath. You know, so I am a dabbler. Okay, fine. <laughs> होता यही है कि हमारे विश्वविद्यालय बहुत बड़े पैमाने पर आज़ाद ख्याली के कातल साबित होते हैं वो हमें मजबूर करते हैं कि हम अपने अपने जिन जिस विषय का भी हमने चयन किया है उसकी कैद से कभी बाहर ना निकल पाए उसको अप, उस कैद खाने को ओढ़ दें और उसी के तम दायरे के अंदर सोचें और उसी तम दायरे के अंदर अपने पठन पाठन का काम करें लेकिन अगर कोई बगावत की आवाज़ नज़र आती है तो वो प्रोफेसर शकुन चक्रवर्ती की शक्ल में नज़र आती है तो ये हमारे ये बहुत ही ख़ास मौका बन जाता है आज का लेक्चर कि हमें आज ये सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ आपको सुनने का और चूँकि आपको सुनने का अवसर प्राप्त हुआ तो ये अपने आप में जश्न की वजह है ये त्यौहार सा बन जाता है आज का दिन इस दृष्टि से आपका विषय था प्रकृति पुरातत्व और साहित्य इन तीनों कोणियों को जोड़ने का जिस खूबसूरती से आज के लेक्चर में हुआ है वो तस्वुर से बने था एक बात जो सामने आती है वो कुल वाज तौर पर साफ उभर के वो ये है कि हमारे लिए मुमकिन ही नहीं कि हम प्रकृति को सराह सकें बगैर मानवीय हस्तक्षेप के वह इंसान की नज़र है जो हमें हमें मज आमादा करती है प्रकृति के अंदर सौंदर्य देखने की योग्यता हमारे अंदर पैदा करती है वो सिर्फ मानवीय नज़र है वरना जब हम खंडर को देखते हैं तो खंडर क्या है एक टूटी फूटी इमारत है लेकिन जब हम मानवीय नज़र से देखते हैं तो हमारे जहन में ये शेर उभरता है ये क्या देखते रहते हो वीरान इमारत को हर ईट तरसती है सांसों की हरारत को तो बहुत से नुक्ते सामने आए दूसरी एक बहुत ही अहम नुक्ता जो सामने आया उभर के वो ये है कि हम अपने अतीत को जब टटोलते हैं खंगालते हैं उसको समझने का प्रयास करते हैं तो जो सवाल हम पूछते हैं अपने अतीत से वो पूरी तरह से निर्भर करते हैं हमारे वर्तमान पर हमारा वर्तमान निर्धारित करता है कि हम क्या सवाल पूछें अतीत से तो सवाल बदल जाते हैं प्रश्न बदल जाते हैं जो हम अतीत से पूछते हैं हमारे समय के अनुसार तो हमारा वर्तमान किस कदर गालिब रहता है हमारे सवालों के ऊपर जो हम अतीत से पूछते हैं ये बात बहुत ही साफ उभर के आई आज के व्याख्यान में दूसरी बात ये कि सभ्यता की तहें होती हैं और सभ्यता की तहें होती हैं और उन तहों को उजागर करता है पुरातत्व पुरातत्व किस तरह से हमारी मदद करता है कला और संस्कृति को समझने में और कला और संस्कृति किस कदर असर अंगेज रहती है साहित्य पर ये बात भी उभर के आई आज के व्याख्यान में वक्त यानी कि समय और भौगोलिक फासले इन दोनों की दूरियां किस तरह से निर्धारित करती हैं हमारी समझ को अतीत के बारे में ये बात भी आज हमने समझने की कोशिश की तो साहित्य किस कदर किस तरह से हमारी उंगली थामता है और हमारी मदद करता है कि हम प्रकृति को सराहा सकें ये एक छोटे से शेर में सिमट के आ जाती है ये बात बल्कि शेर क्या एक मिसरा है शेर भी नहीं है कि शायरी धरती के नासुक गाल पर एक बोसे की तरह आबाद है बोसा उर्दू में चुम्बन को कहते हैं शुक्रिया कहीं मैंने पढ़ा था कि चीन में खुदाई के दौरान पूरा तत्व का संबंध खुदाई से है खुदाई के दौरान एक पत्थर मिला उस पत्थर पे कुछ लिखा हुआ था चीन के विद्वानों ने जो पूरा तत्व वैज्ञानिक थे उस लिखे हुए को पढ़ने में करीब 
बारह साल लगा दिया उस पत्थर को पढ़ने में और निष्कर्ष रूप में जो वो निकाल पाए कि क्या लिखा हुआ है तो वो ये था कि उसमें लिखा हुआ है कि जमाना हाँ पहले तो उसकी तारीफ तय की गई कि ये कितने वर्ष पुराना लिखा पत्थर है ये खुदाई तो उसकी तारीफ तय हुई पाँच हजार साल पुरानी पाँच हजार साल पुरानी उस लिखावट में ये लिखा हुआ था कि जमाना आज का कितना खराब हो गया <laughs> हमारा जमाना क्या था तो सोचिए कि ये कैसी साइकोलॉजी कि आज भी हम लोग अक्सर कहते हैं कि वो एक जमाना था आ, इस क्रम में आ, आप आ, आजाद हैं स्वतंत्र हैं अपने ख्याल रखने के लिए आ, इस ऐतिहासिक वर्ल्ड क्लास लेक्चर के संदर्भ में आप कुछ बोलना चाहते हैं बस एक एक ही प्रश्न छात्र को अनुमति होगी उसके बाद हम लोग इसको समाप्त की तरह पढ़ेंगे सर एक क्वेश्चन मेरा भी है आई ऑल्सो वन मेरी अंग्रेजी तो अच्छी नहीं है आप भी बोल रहे कि कॉलोनाइजेशन और आर्कियोलॉजी का संबंध है मैं थोड़ा और उसको कि आर्कियोलॉजी और कॉलोनाइजेशन के बीच क्या रिलेशन फर्स्ट योर क्वेश्चन देर आर वेरियस काइंड ऑफ थिंग nowadays when we think of archaeology we think of a science we go for excavation we find things if there are uh, instruments which allow us to guess what we might get under the soil then we get permission to dig and then excavate and then we have ways of dating objects radio carbon is now become obsolete we have nuclear dating although calcutta is not a very good place for dating <coughs> the best place is uh, is dekan college pune they have the that this kind of uh, scientific let's call it within quotes scientific archaeology but there are other kinds of archaeology for example field archaeology you, your question was on field archaeology before the coming of excavations of this kind now you can as petrarch said in the 14th century ha ha yes 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 i've got your question the field archaeology is when you did not go through these processes you're going through a field you suddenly find suddenly find an old temple so an old from temple you look at the bricks they are not of this age maybe 500 600 years old now you have to date this temple you have to find out when this temple was built who built it so suppose you go and find that the, there is a temple of konark parts of it is uh, the, uh, are collapsing now we we all know that lord curzon was a very bad man bongo bongo and all that yes. without lot curzon the the konark temple would have collapsed every great building in this country we have allowed them in. wonderful people indians we allow them to collapse everything is in ruins just look at tagore castle near patriyagata everything is in ruins the lot curzon made sure that that temple did not collapse now if you are a field archaeologist lot curzon will give you a call and say you tell me what is the significance of this temple who built it which time what is the century and what is the style etc you are a specialist in field archaeology 
then you can have some kind of what you can call textual interpretation in archaeology. For example, there is an entire place in Korea where you will get stones near, near mountains with script which are which show the a, a Buddhist presence. Small place, small area. Now, these tell us that there was an attempt to make that landscape into a holy landscape. For us, then it has no significance. But once the textual person, expert, how many years to decipher the script? So once you are able to discern what is written there, then or what the, 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 the figures signify, then suddenly then you look at the landscape with new eyes. The landscape which meant nothing maybe two pawn shops now the, the Koreans don't have pawn but never mind the Korean equi equivalent to the pawn shop suddenly that landscape becomes a holy landscape there has been attempts in history to make landscapes with no significance into meaningful, meaningful landscapes so these, these are one, this is one kind of archaeology. There is another, the first one which is a field of archaeology and then this what I call scientific that is usually called in technical terms processual archaeology. Where you process the, whatever you will find, you know, an axe, uh, a figurine, a pot, pot, or a pot, a utensil or whatever. Or a city like in Mohenjo-daro. Then there is interpretive or interpretative uh, archaeology. That is what I have called textual, to make matters simple for you. Then there is another kind of, uh, shall we say, uh, archaeological, uh, that's usually, some, some people call it post-processual archaeology. Post-processual archaeology is something like hermeneutics. It is the science of interpretation. Not just interpreting the landscape, but a kind of cultural palimpsest which shows a network of meaning, network of significance. Even in a game, in a board game, the way you relate it to people, what you brought to the temples, what you ate, what was the syntax of your cooking, everything would be part of cultural studies. Then archaeology comes very close to Levi Strauss and structural anthropology. That is why I mentioned, I was just rushing through, Stephen Greenblatt, who tried to bring literature into what he calls the poetics of culture influenced as he was by the uh, cultural anthropology, uh, not cultural, interpretative anthropology of Clifford Gerns. The last kind of archaeology that I uh, will talk about is uh, which does not believe in any kind of, this is, this is the most uh, sensi sensible way of looking at archaeology and just does not believe in this these 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 uh, watertight compartments at all it's not possible there will be times when you will have to take tenets of one kind of theory and apply it or use it for other kinds where but materials are not available the materials are not available so epigraphy for example which is so important in, 
in history, archaeology, and anthropology, we'll have to take the help of other kinds of sciences. For example, these you know, the science of reading, uh, the, the history of reading, and the history of writing. So these are slowly getting into. See, if, if, if the, we could decipher what is written on the Rosetta Stone because it was translated into a script that we have known. You understand? If there is a script which you cannot read, but there is a translation in Hindi, that, that you can read. So now, with, with the help of this, you will be able to read the unknown script. Unfortunately, the Harappan script has not been decided because there is no such transliteration or trans... Yeah. Rosetta Stone has transliteration and trans relation together. It's one of the most marvelous discoveries of human culture. We are so lucky. Sanskrit kota koto lipi te leka hai. Nevari, Sharda, Kharoshti. Koto shudhu nagri te leka hai na. Nevari, Nepali te ka leka hai. Kintu because we have some transliteration in modern languages, in Nagri, in uh, Bangla, in uh, Gujarati, or any other kind of uh, script, we know that these have a sense how to read these various Sanskrit scripts. Uh, so here you will find that the science of what is known as um, uh, uh, you know, writing. We actually call it paleography, but I don't want to use very hard words. <laughs> you, you don't get enriched by using polysyllabic words. <laughs> you just have to understand that sometimes all these disciplines have to come together in archaeology. So there is so archaeology is not what it used to be in the time of uh, Gordon Child and Stuart Bigot. That you just interpret what you uh, what happened in history by Gordon Chad is one of the one of the books that everybody used to read uh, when we were when we were children. He was a Marxist archaeologist, but uh, I read it in high school. But uh, the various kinds of archaeology. The question that you have asked is is very difficult to. There will be a kind of mixture of, of all these various ways of looking at archaeology. And there are many people who don't do archaeology at the field work at all. They read texts, that's all. For example, they, um, they do, for example, anthropology. There are many people who do not read, uh, they do field work in anthropology. They interpret texts, etc. I, I have a friend who has worked with Aztec manuscripts and found uh, stunning, made stunning discoveries about Aztec culture and is now a big scholar. <laughs> so he did not have to feel archaeology, go to the field and stay in tents all, all your life. He was a, he was a lazy man anyway, but uh, like me, but uh, he's, he's now a great uh, big name in his field. Yeah, your question was now. This is this is uh, a very simple thing. Uh, you know that when you are when you when you conquer a country, or colonize a country, there are two word, words here: colonialism and imperialism. See, India was part of the empire since 1858, not before that. See, Calcutta University, you know, right? We became part of the empire. Before that, we were a colony in the sense that we were ruled by the East India Company, or at least most of India was ruled by the East India Company. Now, one of the first things that you have to do when you have a government, the East India Company was slowly, gradually becoming a government with the viceroys here, and the viceroys council, etc., and the Secretary for India in the India office, uh, East India Company's office, uh, reporting to the government uh, in Britain. You find all these public and judicial papers in 
uh, the Asian Africa collection of British Library, one of the treasure troves you can look at. Uh, slowly it was becoming a government. Now once you have government, first thing you have to government you have to tax people, you have to raise revenue, you have to maintain administrative records, who earns what, in what way. And if you are a colony, you have to make a profit because you have shareholders. East India Company had to invest in tea, spices, this, that, discover tea in Assam, because otherwise, before that indigo and opium, etc. Otherwise, why should people invest? It's a South Sea house in London, which is in, next to Trafalgar Square, where exactly, you know, the, the, the National uh, Gallery is. It collapsed. And people who invested in the East India Company, they got their return, returns 2,000 times over in a matter of 50 years. At Takai, you have your Taka profit. Hmm? And the people who came here, they were not civil servants, they were company civilians who actually were allowed to trade on the side. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, All of you want to go to the United States and these places. Uh, Yale University built with our money because Yale was in the East India Company, he did some business on the side and built a university in the United States and we are all dying to go there. Codrington Library in All Souls College, Oxford, built with the money of slave trade. Road scholarship, Rhodes House, Rhodes Scholarship are built with the slave labor in the diamond mines in Rhodesia. So there is a very close connection on how to rule a particular place or a colony or a country or whatever you call it is no longer 